How many of you know the name Nathan Patterson? No, never heard of him, never heard of the guy. Nathan Patterson went to a Colorado Rockies game a couple of days ago, and there's, they have a little, um, he's a fan of baseball, and he goes to the baseball game, and they have a little area where you can see how fast you can throw the baseball. Well, Nathan had played in high school, didn't play in college, he's about 23 years old, and so he gets up and he throws a few throws, and they're over 90 miles an hour, and then the, the radar gun clocked him over 95, even 96 miles per hour, which very few pros can do. Well, the Oakland A's saw the film, the video of him throwing that, perhaps on social media, and they gave him a contract to, to throw in the semi-pros uh, of, their, of their team until he can prove himself there and then perhaps move up to the big guys and, and play there. Amazing uh, talent, rare talent, and, and a rare find. Uh, he knew he was good, but maybe he didn't realize how good, uh, but now he's been discovered. Um, how many of you know the name Grace Vanderwall? Grace Vanderwall. Grace is 15 years old and is a recording artist. And at 12 years old, Grace uh, took her ukulele and her very unusual voice and sang a song on America's Got Talent and immediately got buzzed with a golden buzzer. Anybody who ever watched America's Got Talent, apparently that's how you get advanced to the live final round uh, and you pass all the preliminary rounds and go right to the top. And Grace, uh, soon after that show, got a recording contract and tours regularly at 15 years old. And you, you hear stories about that amazing talent and rare talent at such a young age and this guy who can throw the socks off a baseball and, and just, uh, just sometimes in your heart you think, wow, if only I had that talent. I wish I, and we find ourselves kind of coveting at times people who have such unusual rare talents and, and skills and gifts that we think, wow, I, I wish that were me. And, that, and that's, that's oftentimes our default when we hear of or see stories like that. And I believe we transfer that into our relationship with God. We think if only I had, if only I were more bold, if only I were more, if only I were more skilled, if I could, only I could remember more verses, if, if only I had what it took to, to, to beat this temptation, if only I had what it took to... to, to to work through maybe some painful memories. If I had more courage, if I had this, or if I had that. And the Lord tells us, especially through the writings of Paul, that it's when we are weak that He is strong. That the Lord doesn't tell us to take inventory of our own resources, of our own gifts and talents and wit and wisdom he says, come to me just as you are, available, seek me, you will find me, ask, seek, and knock, and watch what I can do through you. As we've been going through Hebrews, we've been seeing some of the Old Testament saints. Last week, we looked at how the children of Israel were rescued by the blood of an innocent lamb to be freed from Egypt a picture of our salvation in Christ, that we simply apply the blood of Christ, we trust in the blood of Christ to, to set us free from sin. That was our salvation. It took faith to do that, right? Maybe you prayed a sinner's prayer. Maybe you were alone. Maybe you were with someone else when you prayed. But then we come to the edge of the promised land, and like the ten spies, we see giants in the land, and we turn back in fear. When the Lord is saying the same faith that it took to get us out is the fa same faith that it takes to get us in. And something we need to know about our Lord, that He brought us out in order to get us in. He didn't bring us out so that we would wander in the wilderness of fear and discouragement and depression. He brought us out so that we would live in the land of His fullness and of His sufficiency. And the same faith that got us out is the faith. It's simply trusting in Him. We trusted in Him to save us eternally. Do we trust in Him to save us from whatever is that giant that is in front of us today? It could be a giant that is in our past. It could be one that's very much in our present or future. 
the giant of debt, the giant of pain, the giant of poor health, the giant of a challenge at work, or a giant of an awkward relationship, or the giant, again, of terrible memories that we just try to defeat in our own strength. And we continue to be defeated because instead of trusting in Him, we're trusting in our own resources. In Hebrews 11, verse 29, it says, By faith... They passed through the Red Sea as, they were, as though they were passing through dry land, and the Egyptians, when they attempted, were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been encircled for seven days. Just two verses, but there's a span between verse 29 and verse 30 of 40 years. Forty years passed between verse 29 and verse 30. Forty years of wilderness wandering. Forty years of a generation having to die off. Those parents who didn't trust in God, who fled in fear, believed the poor report, the negative bad report of the ten spies. The consequence was, God said, that generation's got to die off. Your kids are going to see the land, but you're not. Contrary to popular belief, Canaan, the promised land, is a picture of heaven. It's not a picture of heaven. If it is a picture of heaven, we're all in big trouble <laughs> because in Canaan, there are giants, <laughs> there are battles, there are fortresses, there are, there's conflict, there are enemies all throughout Canaan. If that's a picture of heaven, heaven's not something for us to really look forward to. Canaan is a picture of the Christian life. Well, now that makes a lot of sense that it's a picture of the Christian life. If there's giants there, if there's enemies there, if there are battles, absolutely. Because we come to Christ. And sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. Sometimes we see battles and experience things that we had no idea even existed before we were in Christ. Why? Because we were dead before we were in Christ. And then we are alive in Christ. We go into the land and whoa, what just happened? And the Lord says... Just as I defeated the enemies of my children, the children of Israel, so I'll defeat the enemies before you. Exodus 14, 14. You need only to stand still. Watch and see the victory that he's going to bring. So here we see the children of Israel finally making it to the land of promise. And from a typology perspective, in other words, from a picture and what these Old Testament stories and characters represent, from a typology perspective, it's fitting that Moses is dead at this point and will not be the one to take them in. Well, why is that? I like Moses. He's really great. He's got a great faith. Absolutely. He had amazing faith to get them out. But as we saw last week, or two weeks ago, pardon me, he struck the rock twice. He was taking them back to the victory of the cross, which is an amazing victory. We're going to celebrate that during communion today. We need to always celebrate that. But the reason communion is so significant, the reason the cross continues to be significant for us is because it helps us to have victory beyond the cross in our everyday living. Say, Lord, you did it there. You'll do it again. You died in my place. Lord, I know you will live in my place. You had victory on the cross. Lord, you can have victory in my life. You see? Moses, like I said, it's very fitting that he is now dead. Why is that? Why? Because Moses represents the law. Moses represents the law. And the law can never bring us into the promises of God. Never. We do not enter into the promises of God through the law. The law is to bring us to the threshold of faith. The law is to help us to see, I can't do that. That's right, you can't do that. You can't fulfill the big ten. <laughs> Even the, any of them, pick any of the ten commandments. We all have failed on every one of them. Not only because it says if you, fa fa if you fail or sin or broken one of the commandments, you've broken them all, but also because we can actually go down the list and say, yeah, I've, I've done that, I've done that. We can go down and see. Moses represents the law, and the law can never bring us in. Again, appropriate. And Moses is not the one taking them in. Joshua is. It has to be Jesus to take us into the land. And how appropriate that the first book of the Bible named after a person is Joshua. 
another pronunciation, another language of the name Jesus. He is the only one qualified to take them into the promises of God. And Jesus is the only one qualified to take us into the promises of God. Let me ask you, were these three million or so people, the children of Israel, warriors? Some of them were. Yeah, some of them. But the masses were not. The masses were women and children, if you will. And then there were the priests. There was not a task that they faced, especially going into the land, in their first battle into the land, that they were able to handle on their own. They didn't have those tools in their toolbox. <laughs> they didn't have what it takes to have victory over Jericho and the people of Canaan and the giants that were in the land. But God did. And the same God who brought them out is the same God who would bring them in. And the same God who saved you, Christian, is the same God who wants to save you today from fear, from anxiety, from worry, from stress, from despair, from depression, from whatever it is that we find ourselves battling with, whatever giant is in front of you. The Lord says, apply the same faith. Trust me. You need only to stand still. Exodus 14, 14 again. God brought them out in order to bring them in. And He has brought us out to take us in. And by the way, both crossings, the crossing of the Red Sea in verse 29 and the crossing of the Jordan and going into Jericho in verse 30 are equally miraculous. Both crossings are equally miraculous. It is miraculous that any of us will be able to have life after this life, that is a miracle of God's grace. But it is also equally miraculous that we will be able to pray and to seek the Lord and to stand still and to watch Him defeat a foe that is in front of us. Again, it may be something in our own mind. And He, he defeats it. He levels it because we trusted in Him. Here's the thing. God is trying to get His church to look vertically instead of so often looking horizontally. Sometimes, yes, God uses the gifts of the people around us. Absolutely. But sometimes we seek secular psychiatry, a psychologist, or, or Oprah, or Dr. Phil, or whatever, and we look horizontally. Or even sometimes I'll, I'll hear just such nonsense from believers. You're not going to believe what I heard on the radio, what I saw on social media. And they believe it as if it's gospel. And it's completely contrary to the Word of God. The Lord is wanting us to look away from the horizontal long enough to see vertically, to look to Him and to get our salvation, get our victory in Him. But instead, what do we do? We wander around for 40 minutes, 40 days, 40 weeks, or maybe 40 months or 40 years in a drought because we are afraid, either afraid to go to Him or negligent to go to Him. But I believe what it is mostly, church, is we don't have the faith to go to Him. This book is about faith. This chapter in Hebrews, it's about faith. It's about faith in God. It's about trusting Him. God, You are the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. You are the same forever. And Lord, I will trust in You because my eyes right now fail me. My heart fails me. But God, I'm going to trust in You. And I don't know how You're going to defeat this giant, but God, I'm going to trust in You and I'm going to stand still. Let's go to Joshua 6 and let's see how Israel had victory, the children of Israel, against all odds as they crossed into Jericho. I'm going to remind us that a couple of weeks ago when we were in the previous verses talking about Moses and we touched on Joshua a little bit, that back in chapter 5 of Joshua, we see a man confronting Joshua before he was to lead the people to cross the Jordan and face this daunting task of having victory in the land of promise. And he faced this man in verse 13 of chapter 5. It says, Now it came about when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, nope, 
<laughs> in other words, neither. Rather, indeed, I have come now as the captain of the host of the Lord. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, What is my Lord to say to his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place you're standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Let me ask you, does that sound familiar? Sound like the burning bush? That was God revealing himself, his holiness to Moses. And I want you to notice that the man with the sword in his hand did not say, no, no, don't worship me, like Paul had to when the locals in their missionary journeys tried to worship them. He said, no, 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 don't, don't worship me. He, he let him worship him. What does that tell us? This is a Christophany. This is Jesus before Bethlehem. This is the man with the sword in his hand. The word made flesh. I just have thought, what must that sword have looked like? <laughs> just, you ever think about that? Was it, was it shining? Was it, was it, was it bright? And was, was, I don't think it was a little, little dime store dagger. I think it was pretty awesome. And I love that he said, neither. He said, no. Have you come for us or for our adversaries? And you don't understand. I don't take sides. I take over. And that was the pivotal point for Joshua, and it's the pivotal point for us before we step over through our Jordan on dry ground into what God has for us and the giants He wants to defeat before us. First, we've got to start, church, make a note on our faces. We've got to get on our faces before God and say, God, I don't have it figured out. I'm not going to give you my agenda. Lord, I come empty-handed and just open before you, God. Here I am. And you bow before Him and say, God, Whatever you want to do, you know my situation. You know my issues. You know the problems. You know the giants I face. God, do what you want to do. And we humbly bow before him. And we have the faith to do that. Now Jericho, verse 1 of chapter 6, was tightly shut because of the sons of Israel. No one went out and no one came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given you Jericho into your hand with its king and its valiant warriors, and you shall march around the city, all the men of war circling the city once. You shall do so for six days. So how many times were they to circle for each of those six days? One time, right? Also, seven priests shall carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark. Then on the seventh day, you shall march around the city seven times. And the priests shall blow the trumpets and it shall be that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people will go up, every man straight ahead. So Joshua, the son of Nun, by the way, it says the son of Nun. That doesn't mean that his mom lived in a convent. That's number one. And it also doesn't mean that he had no parents. Okay, just let me clarify that. Not the son of N-O-N-E, but the son of Nun. Not the son of a nun. Okay, just... That can be confusing sometimes. <laughs> Not the son of a nun, but the son. Of, that's his dad's name. His dad was, dad's name was Nun. All right. Called the priest, Joshua called the priest and said to them, take up the Ark of the Covenant and let the seven priests carry seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. Stop right there. Verse six is key. Make a note. Joshua 6, 6. Easy to remember. What did they carry? The Ark of God. That was a picture of God's presence, right? And it was for them God's presence. You carry within you, church, the ark of God. The person of the Holy Spirit of God is in you. You carry Him in you. Make sure that you recognize that and humbly acknowledge that before you go into battle. Lord, thank you that you are sufficient to handle what I'm about to face. I don't have what it takes. I don't have the tools in my toolbox. But God, you do. And so we humbly acknowledge that. Lord, fill me afresh with your Holy Spirit. You've got this battle, Lord. I don't. The person of the Holy Spirit. Then he said to the people, Go forward and march around the city and let the armed men go on before the ark of the Lord. And it was so that when Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord went forward and blew the trumpets. And the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. And the armed men went before the priest and blew the trumpets. And the rear guard came after the ark while they were continuing to blow the trumpets. 
Now Joshua commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout, nor let your voice be heard, nor let a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I tell you to shout. Then you shall shout. But on the first six days, they're not shouting. Exodus 14, 14. Again, you need only to be still. He's telling them to be silent. So he had the ark of the Lord taken around the city. Circling it once, they came into the camp and spent the night in the camp. Then Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. And the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and blew the trumpets. And the armed men went on before them, and the rear guard came in the, after the ark of the Lord while they continued to blow the trumpets. This, thus the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did so for six days. Then it came about on the seventh day that they rose early at the dawning of the day, and they marched around the city in the same manner seven times. Only on that day they marched around the city seven times. And it came about at the seventh time when the priests blew the trumpets. Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord, make a note, has given you the city. We're going to pause there in the reading of Joshua chapter 6. Listen, church. Give me your attention for a moment. When did they praise? When did they shout? Before the victory came. That required what? Verse 30, Hebrews 11. Go look at it. Hebrews 11, 30. It required faith. By faith, they entered. Here's where we err. When we say, I can't wait to praise the Lord after this is done. That's a mistake. I can't wait to be freed up from this so I can really worship the Lord again. And that's a mistake. Praise the Lord now. Right now. Why? Because He's worthy. I love that the, that the Lord told them to blow the trumpet, blow the ram's horns for all those days. But that's the only sound that the Canaanites heard. The sound of the ram's horn. That continues to this day to be a symbol and to, be a, to go before Israel when they worship, to call them to worship, to remind them of God's power and strength. And it should do the same for us. That we go into worship not after the victory has been won, but because God said the victory has been won. Amen? We go into worship and we worship God and we thank God. We get our face before Him. We say, thank you, God. I don't get it. I don't know how you're going to defeat this giant, but God, I know that you are strong enough. I know that you are able. And so God, I bow before you and I, I worship you right now because you can do this. I can't. These three million people, the majority of them, don't even know how to hold a sword. They, all three million of them, were slaves in the land from which God delivered them. They don't have what it takes to defeat the giants, to defeat and to ransack Jericho. They've not read the book, church. <laughs> They've not read the rest of the chapter. They don't know the wall is going to fall. It's so familiar to us, it becomes a little complacent sometimes. Yeah, the wall's going to fall. It's really cool. And the Lord did amazing things. There's children's stories and Sunday school lessons, and it's been in there for eons. Be careful. When we are facing giants. But Lord, the giant hadn't fallen yet. It hadn't fallen yet. It's still there, God. So you're going to worry and wander around the wilderness of worry? Are you going to be anxious? Are you going to be fearful and wander around the wilderness for 40 days, weeks, months, years? Are you going to trust in God and worship Him now? That's where the victory comes. That's where the faith, the, the faith is applied. Listen. If we are worshiping Him after the victory, where's the faith? Our faith must be tested. The Lord allows... Could God have put them in Canaan with no opposition? Yes. The Word tells us that He left enemies in the land in order to grow them up, to, to strengthen them, to test their faith. He does the same for us. So 
So instead of being mad at the devil all the time <laughs> about the giants in the land, let's go to the Lord. Say, God, thank you that you are greater. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Thank you, God, that I'm not able to defeat this foe in my own strength. But God, you are able. You are sufficient. He says, shout, for the Lord has given you the city. He has given it to you. Christian, let me ask you, did God save you in order for you to live in defeat? No, he didn't. He saved you in order for you to live in victory. So, once again, in preparing to cross, God tells them to send the ark into the Jordan first. And the priests carrying the ark are like, okay, um, uh, it's not parted yet. <laughs> uh, I don't remember... This part of the, the, the Red Sea, it was parted and dry when we crossed. You want us to step in? Yeah, because he, he, he frees us. He sets us free. He does an amazing work at our salvation. But then perhaps the test is a little harder the next time. And so they go in. And as they step in, the water stands up way upstream in a heap, it says. And amazingly, miraculously, as they carry it in, somewhere upstream, stands in a heap. And they cross, the others, cross on dry ground while the Ark of the Covenant goes before them. And again, they hadn't seen something like this since they were kids. These adults were kids when they crossed the Red Sea. Then they are told, after they cross, they are told to take 12 stones and make a memorial on the Canaanite side of the Jordan and in the middle of the Jordan. I think it would be an awesome archaeological find, wouldn't it? That maybe during a drought or something over there, the Jordan gets really low, and I was like, oh, there's 12 stones. That would be amazing. They may still be there, whatever. Pile them up as a memorial on the Canaanite side. And by the way, when John the Baptist was baptizing in the Jordan, that was at Beth Barah. At Beth Barah, where he was baptizing. And he said to them something you may recognize. He said, don't say we have Abraham for our father. God is able to raise up children of Abraham from these stones. Beth Barah means the valley of the passengers. I would suspect he likely was pointing at these stones that we're seeing right here. Pretty cool. God's able to raise up children of Israel from these stones right here at Beth Barah where they crossed, the valley of the passengers. In other words, the valley where they crossed into the Holy Land. So they go in and they see this fortress of a city and perhaps someone said to Joshua, you sure we're not lost? <laughs> you want to check your GPS because this isn't really what I was expecting. Another battle. And they're told to circle the city quietly and do it again day after day after day after day, and all they hear is the sound of trumpets. Maybe they're praying while they're circling, but they're not saying a word. He says, don't sing, don't pray. You may recognize the song that the trumpeteers are playing, that the priests are blowing on the shofar. Don't do it. Stay quiet. You need only to stand still. You need only to wait on the Lord. Faith, we learn from this event, this amazing event. Faith must be patient. We've got to be patient in our faith. Faith also must be very vulnerable. They were very vulnerable. As they walked around this city, they could have been shot, bows and arrows, whatever they would have been hit with. They were very vulnerable. They were trusting in their leader and trusting in the Lord who had spoken to him. They also must be, faith must also be obedient. You want us to do what? <laughs> we're going to take this city by circling it several times and then shouting. The Lord said, I will share my glory with no one. If it was their cunning, if it was their strategy, if it was their strength that had brought them victory, they would get the glory. And it's the same with us. If we were able to figure it out on our own and cunning and whatever horizontal resource we go to, even ourselves, the Lord doesn't get the credit. He doesn't get the praise. But if it's just God, it can only be explained as God, then He gets the glory. The Lord says, I am. 
He can also follow with, you ain't. (laughs) And that's a good reminder for us that we're not. So he removes all the avenues of escape from our lives sometimes. Have you noticed that? He'll remove all the avenues of escape from our lives. Every out that we had, he'll say, I'm going to remove all those things. And I'm going to be your only resource. And the only way to look is up instead of out. He says, I'm going to remove all the things. They didn't have any other hope as they were circling Jericho. They had horns. There were some mighty men of valor. There were some some warriors, but nothing compared to what they were up against. Definitely not enough to defend three million. And the walls came down. And church, the walls in our lives will come down when we do it His way. I want to finish with 2 Corinthians because that um, passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 really sums it up well. For though we walk in the flesh or in the body, we walk in these physical bodies. We don't war according to the flesh. Now the word for war there is strategize in the Greek. We don't strategize in the flesh or in the body according to wit and wisdom and cunning. That's not how we strategize. For the weapons of our warfare, the word for warfare there is strategy. The weapons of our strategy are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We're destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Listen, church, prayer is a spiritual weapon. Prayer is a spiritual weapon, and it is an atomic bomb in the camp of the enemy. When he's listing, when Paul's talking about the armor of God, he he says all these things, the shield of faith, the breastplate of righteousness, shod your feet with the gospel of peace, the belt of truth, and all these, the sword of the Spirit. After listing all those things, he then says, then with all prayer, pray all the time. Prayer is our spiritual weapon that God has given us to defeat a spiritual enemy. Listen again. Prayer is that spiritual weapon that God has given us to defeat a spiritual enemy. Have you noticed so often the thing that is the giant in front of us isn't that intimidating once the the battle is done? What the real enemy was was right inside here or inside here. Our fears, our anxieties, our stress, our depression, all those things we let our mind run wild. Instead of going to Him, verse 5, take every thought captive. Take that thought, throw it in jail to the obedience of Christ. Faith requires obedience. And it's when we find ourselves obeying God in this way and trusting in Him that we see victory. Take those thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. Yeah, but you don't understand, man. You know, it may be somebody, you may say, I'm single and I really have been praying for this or I'm, I'm married and I've been praying for that. You know, I've got this issue at work. I've got this issue with my health. I've got this issue. You don't understand. It's just, this is really a big giant, man. Right? And we all have been there. Maybe it's been this day or this week that we've whined that way to someone else or to the Lord or even, again, in our own minds. But God is the God of impossible solutions. A friend of mine um, was trusting God instead of dating. Now, my friend is an African-American guy, loves the Lord. He, he and I were on staff at Calvary Chapel in Fort Lauderdale. Back in the day when Calvary Chapel was kind of small, there was only about 4,000 people there. And there were about 14 of us on staff, and he was one of the ones on staff. And, and Don was just trusting in the Lord. He wasn't dating. Besides that, he was about at a church that was about 99.9% uh, white. And, and everybody else, you know, there's a couple of folks who come through, African-American, you know, all this. And, but he was like, man, no, I'm not going to date, man. I'm just trusting the Lord. I'm praying. I'm trusting the Lord. I'm trusting the Lord. And it, it's, wow. That's, that's awesome. So this girl 
happens to be invited to church and they meet, they start talking, they start visiting, they start going out kind of as a group, everybody you know, and all of a sudden he feels like the Lord's kind of saying, I'm, I brought her to you. She was a Brazilian supermodel. And, and I don't remember her name, but uh, it's hard to pronounce, but Don and she are now married and serving the Lord in Colorado. Now, I'm not saying single guys, <laughs> that God's going to bring you a supermodel. But I'm saying that when we look vertically, God's able to do amazing things. Well, I've been looking vertically for 40 days, weeks, months. I don't want it to be 40 years. And it may not be for a spouse, but it may be some other area, some other giant in your life. Like I mentioned at the beginning, it may be a memory. Maybe something painful that you're thinking, you know, Lord, I really need healing in my life from this. God, can you, can you heal my mind? God, can you rescue my child? Can you rescue my parent? Can you rescue my friend? And we, we carry that burden with us. And we carry it. And I believe we need to take those thoughts captive. We need to take them captive to the obedience of Christ because our, our battle is not flesh and blood. It is spiritual. And we go to the Lord and we pray he said, bring it to the God, bring it to the Lord. And our weapons of warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty, divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Isn't it interesting? And I'll finish with this thought that he says, for the destruction of fortresses. What did we just see in Joshua? The destruction of a fortress in the physical. It fell down. And it's the same in our lives emotionally and spiritually. We war according to the Spirit. And we will see those fortresses fall when we do battle His way. When we battle in the flesh, we will often lose. We battle in the Spirit. We'll see victory. When? When am I going to see the victory? I don't know. God knows. God knows. And so Joshua led the children of Israel. But before he did, he came face to face and bowed on his face with the man with the sword in his hand. And the man with the sword in his hand is here today. The Holy Spirit of God is here with us. We're going to have a time of communion now. And as we do, we're going to have an opportunity to do business with him to search our own hearts, to allow Him to search our, our hearts and to invite Him to have His way in us. So let's pray before we have that time. Father, we thank You for this time of Bible study and we pray, God, that You would take Your truth, plant it deep in our hearts and bear fruit for Your kingdom for eternity that we would bring You glory and only You would get the praise. Through Jesus we pray. Amen.